we will wait another 20, 30 seconds so we can have all the attendees joining uh, so we can start the webinar. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are joining today. Today is our third webinar of the series of the Anaerobic Digestion Innovation and Business. And my name is Amir Akbari, I'm the CEO of Anessa, and I'm host, your host today. This webinar series is hosted by Anessa with the, to create an opportunity to bring together professionals from the biogas industries in order to discuss the key topics and challenges, and most likely to find a solution for those challenges that we are seeing in the industry. The series has six topics. We had two sessions in last year, and today is the, our third session, deep diving on the identifying the profitable biogas projects. Some housekeeping items before we start the webinar. Uh, the panels will give a quick introduction of themselves and the companies they represent. Following introduction and presentation, I will start the roundtable discussion on the most frequent question on the topic. Participants can ask questions using the QA button at the bottom of your screens at any time during the presentation. The panelists will be answering the questions at the last part of the webinar. The recording of this webinar, along with the contact information of all the panelists, will be provided to you on the following day, so you can ask and engage directly all the panelists if you are interested in their work in the biogas industry. Before I introduce our uh, guest today, I'd like to thank Biogas World for promoting and putting together this webinar series. Today's panelists uh, bring a tremendous experience in the biogas industry. We have three different point of views from the technology provider, so like engineering service providers and financier. And I'm looking for our discussion uh, for our this, this webinar. I will introduce them uh, briefly. And after that, we will do the presentation. Our first guest today is Christian Eiler, technical sales manager at Envitech Biogas. He's joining us today from Saarbrück, Germany. Christian's background is in agriculture and construction engineering. He joined Envitech Biogas in 2007 as planning engineering and sales back office. In 2010, became the sales manager for the German market. And since 2014, he has a role of technical sales manager for Envitech Biogas. Welcome, Christian. Our second panelist is Greg Montgomery. Greg currently serves as the managing director of clean source capital the specialty finance affiliate of the Abandoned Power Group based in Charlotte, North Carolina. In his 35 years of his career, he has worked extensively with uh, financial and strategic parties in executing of the transactions. In his current role, Greg is involved in the design, administration, and advising of clean energy and environmental sustain sustainability financing programs and projects. Previously, Greg practiced corporate and security law in North Carolina and Maryland. He received JD MBA from Tulane University, Bachelor of Art in Environmental Science from the University of Virginia, and most recently was a graduate of the year-long certificate course offered by Yale's School of Forestry and Business Management on financing and deploying clean energy. I'm so happy to have you, Greg, on board for the Senate webinar. Thank you, man. And our last panelist today is Jonathan Cristiani advanced power fuel engineer of Black & Veatch. Jonathan is a licensed professional engineer and credential project management professional who worked across the Black & Veatch business units focused primarily on bioenergy and hydrogen consulting services. His duties include uh, technology evaluation, resource assessment, feasibility studies, performer economic analysis, conceptual engineering, and engineering and project management assistant. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from University of Virginia and Master's degree in Gas Engineering from Illinois Institute of Technology. Welcome, uh, Jonathan. With this uh, brief bio, I'll hand over the, the floor to Christian to start the presentation. 
And after that, we will follow with the other panelists. Christian, the floor is yours. Take it from you. Okay. I uh, hope you can see my screen now. Yep. Yes, if you go for okay. the full, mo full mode, there you go. Yep. Okay, thanks first of all, Amir and Anessa for the being part of your webinar, and also Biogos World, who is also behind the scenes working on this, and for the nice introduction. I'm Christian Island. I'm working, as Ami already said, for Emitech Biogas, which is one of the leading companies in the, uh, in the biogas sector in Europe. Um, we are active since 2002. And yeah, we are working on the whole chain of biogas production, running plants, and also on the service business. Uh, we are since July 2007 stock market listed. So all our numbers are public, uh, open to see. And we are uh, working with approximately at the moment 430 employees worldwide and uh, try to improve, of course, our business to further new markets. Where we are. So coming from Europe, our main market was Germany. And then around we were building up in Italy, uh, Czech Republic, Netherlands, Belgium, France, uh, the UK, um, then moved further to Denmark, uh, Latvia and other countries. But also you see here we have a big player, China and the uh, Southeast Asia region where we have moved in the last years. And we've already also been busy in the USA in the past years where we have uh, totally built four biogas plants. So what we did in total is that we built over 679 modules in total. And you see the capacity is most of them, of course, are built in, in the European region where we're coming from. A few, as I said, in the USA and, and, and a big part also in China right now, which is also a moving market where it's moving forward. What are we doing? What are we offering? Um, Emitech is offering a complete chain plant construction, where it starts with engineering, permissioning, everything, implementation, commissioning, repowering of plants. We are delivering biological and technical service. And what we are doing in Germany and all some other European countries is that we have own plant operation. So, and that's also where we are coming to the topic to identify the right plants and to find the right areas to go for. So we do have in the on plant operation, we do the complete chain. So with operation of the plant with the management purchases, raw material, logistics, bringing the uh, residuals away, and then also marketing of the electricity and also for the gas. So complete wide range. What makes own plant operation to an interesting chain? Um, in the end, it's attractive to go there. We, we have uh, currently working on, on 65 megawatt approximately, which we are running ourselves. It delivers us a stable income. So we see uh, that's one of the chains where you have always a stable income and not so volatile as for service or for the construction of uh, plants. So that's why we are also keen to find new markets where it's uh, on the long term, interesting to build more and more biogas plants and also run them themselves, maybe. And how to find the right markets and projects? That's an interesting question always. First of all, we see it in Europe, you need reliable environment and politics. So you need um, legislations which are stable and not are only valid for one or two years or three years or four years when one election and the next election, everything is skipped afterwards. And because most of the projects are not running without any subsidies or feed in tariffs uh, profitable, to be honest. So you need, in that case, reliable conditions. And on the other hand, a biogas plant is a living process and you need input and have output. So you need long term feedstock supply. So you need someone you trust there on the end. You need, for example, long term contracts 
to, to be sure and secured on the one hand side and also for the offtake for the residue to be sure that you are having not there a discrepancy at the end and uh, having difficulties there. And what we see also as a uh, point which is very important is the byproduct usage. For example, from the CHPs, the heat. The heat has a value um, for the housing and industry sector. Um, we see in a different, uh, a lot of different applications where there is a big benefit. And we see for the future, that's an interesting market, uh, even with uh, actual discussion about CO2 reduction with the heat produced from biogas, clean biogas, that you can have their um, uh, additional margin for CO2 reductions uh, compared to natural gas heating. What are the right customers to approach? That's always a question. We have here a, a few numbers of our customers where we're working. These are some big agricultural, let's say agricultural industrial customers, but also you see here the cosmetic industry like L'Oreal, uh, which have also some materials available and they also have a, an interest to have the complete value chain in their hands so that they're having lots uh, less waste material at the end and having a, a closed loop, a good cycle, which gives them a better carbon footprint at the end for their production rate and also for the for the permitting and legislation, what, what's in place to have a uh, yeah, better footprint in overall. And that's uh, for a lot of other suppliers, let's say for the big uh, distributors, for example, Orsted, Dong Energy, uh, and other ones, uh, Free Air Green Power, interesting concepts. So you have to look from our perspective, where is in the future uh, the biggest potential additional to, to uh, feed in tariffs to uh, keep carbon credits and other things available that, that will bring the biggest margin from our perspective for the future. That was it already. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Christian. It was really interesting to see your customer base from the agriculture side to the beauty uh, suppliers to energy suppliers that uh, it's going to be a bring a lot of conversation interesting point of the conversation to our panel discussion today thank you for that greg you're next please take it from you okay thank you let me get my share screen going uh Let's see. How do I do up? Okay, so I'm Greg Montgomery, with, uh, Managing Director of Clean Source Capital. Thank you, Christian, for your comments. Amir, thank you for organizing the panel. Uh, I'm going to speak to the factors that we see in uh, profitable biogas projects that we're involved with the financing on. Uh, uh, but first, let me just give you a quick overview of who we are. Uh, clean Source, uh, we're a specialty finance firm, as Amir said, based in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're a member of the Abundant Power Group, which is a holding company started to bring uh, uh, capital flows into uh, the clean energy economy back in 2009. We now have four affiliates. We've got a building analytics company, Point Guard, that, uh, that works with the, uh, the data coming out of building control systems to make buildings perform more efficiently, both for tenant comfort systems improvement, as well as energy savings that pays for the offering as a service, energy as a service. We have an affiliate, Sustain RNG, uh, that we created two years ago um, uh, that has an exclusive license for a proprietary technology developed by Train Technologies, Ingersoll RAN, uh, to, to optimize biomethane production in the agriculture market. And then we most recently started Climate Capital Partners, which is focused on helping to solve the issue of equity for smaller projects um, um, in the institutional capital marketplace. But uh, Clean Source is where I sit, and we are, uh, as I said, especially a finance firm with a mission simply to foster project development uh, in furtherance of the Paris Climate Accord. 
so we that's all that's all we do we finance projects that fit within the uh, the four corners of the paris climate accord we do energy efficiency distributed generation water conservation sustainable infrastructure and uh, our competencies are really understanding the technology that we work with marketing originating the projects the structuring accounting uh, accessing capital markets, compliance. We have as solutions, we are involved with bonds. Uh, we, we, we focus on green bonds, which is an emerging uh, 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 part of the capital markets for investors that are looking for sustainable investments. Uh, we also work with different uh, senior debt providers, commercial pace, leases, energy service agreements, and equity. Um, our on the program side, we have a proprietary platform we call the SAVES platform, which stands for Sustainable and Verifiable Energy Savings. And we've set up multiple programs across the southeastern mid-Atlantic United States, where a lot of our business comes from, uh, where uh, you know, we either have funded these projects through the programs or the program. If, if we can't fund them through the programs, then we work with the clients to find other solutions in the capital markets. So we have done a lot of work in the biogas industry and really enjoy it. Think it's kind of where solar was back in 2008. Uh, you know, it's early on. Uh, and so I'm gonna to speak to some of the things that we look for in projects to ensure that they can find the right financing solution in the capital markets. Let's, let's, start, let's start at the high level. Uh, and <laughs> this is a great term that uh, I came across from a a developer uh, a, a couple of years back, and I use it all the time. You know, is the project coate or is it inchoate? And inchoate means only partially in existence and imperfectly formed. And if it's inchoate, it's not going to get financed. Okay, so it has to be well conceived and ready to go to construction, so that you can go out into the market and and uh, the, uh, the the qualified financing parties are going to know that this is a real project that's going to get done, and they're going to act on it. So. Before we get into the some some of the details, of what makes for a co-ed project, you know the, the high level issues that I think um, we, the audience should consider is the difference between a developer and an originator. Um, there are a lot of folks out there that are originating projects, and that's a very valuable role in the ecosystem of project finance because they have the relationships with the farmers or the industrial facilities or the townships, etc. But are they experienced in developing projects? And that's two different things. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if you are an originator and you do have good, a good access to projects, you may want to either bring that experience in house or partner with a third party developer who has the qualifications and experience to get a project over the goal line and get it to financing. And a key component of that is having the financial wherewithal to, 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 engage in all the activities it's required to get a project to what I'm calling pre-NTP, NTP being noticed to proceed with construction. And so that capital, either the developer needs to have it on their balance sheet uh, internally, or they need to have access to, uh, to third parties, ready, ready access to third parties um, to, get, to get that uh, capital. And there's a growing number of providers of development capital because this really is a constraint in the industry right now is the ability to properly tee up projects and get the development activities done to where they can get financed in the marketplace. And, and another key component of the developers, and, and this is a little, little nuanced, is the ability to engage and compel third parties to act. You know, third party consents, third party actions are very critical to, to the timeline. And in many, in many cases, they are the, uh, the sort of the, the critical path to financing. And a developer, you know, a, a good developers have an innate sense about how to get third parties to act and to, to make decisions and to move because time is not an ally for a project. It is, it is an enemy for a project. And the longer the project strings out, the more opportunity there is for intervening factors to come into play that'll get things off track. And then finally, is having all the necessary components either in place or a very clear line of sight to getting them in place within the time frame for the project to get developed. And so these are, these are beyond the pre-development stage. These are sort of that middle stage between pre-development and NTP before you go to construction. 
And that's what we're going to talk about. There's still, even, even when you get you know, these, these, fact, these 10 factors we're going to talk about in place, you still have a lot of small detail-oriented items, a, a punch list of items to get in place before you can go to financial closing. But, uh, but, but the, the, these factors, these key components are what we look for to make certain that it is a co a real project that's ready to get financed. So first is uh, commercially proven technology. You know, we want to see that there's recognized vendors that are providing the equipment with experience and credit worthiness. We don't want uh, science experience, experiments. Um, you know, that's not to say you, you can't work with relatively new technology. It, if there's some referenceable plants and there's an understood engineering uh, and science behind it, then you can, you can get uh, performance warranty insurance in the marketplace for newer technologies. It's expensive, but it'll help, it helps to get these newer technologies through the valley of death into a commercial marketplace. So that's the first component we look for, the, the technology that's involved. Second, as uh, Christian spoke to, the, you know, we wanna make certain that there's feedstock and that it's contracted uh, to the benefit of the project. And then there's an ample supply of the feedstock within the, within the region of the project. Um, and so, you know, uh, like an on-site dairy project, uh, presumably is going to have ample feedstock coming from the dairy farm on which it's situated. But if not, you want to make certain that there's dairy farms in the surrounding area where it could be transported in if need be, if there were something to happen to that dairy farm. Same thing with, you know, if you have a poultry digester um, that is in the middle of a, of, a, of, a, of a farming region, you just, you want to have an understanding of the, of the feedstock uh, landscape surrounding that to make certain there's adequate supply and then you need to understand the energy content of that feedstock and are there any contaminants like a, in, a, in a landfill gas, you know, xyloxines or other materials, or if it's, uh, you know, if, it, if it's an agricultural waste, just understanding what has to be removed from ultimately the biogas um, when, it, when it comes out of the digester. Um, you want to make certain that your interests are aligned with the feedstock supplier, and that's reflected in the contractual terms and how they're compensated and, and benefit from the project. And so they're mindful of the continuing their operations and making certain the feedstock is supplied in adequate quantities and qualities. Um, and you may um, ideally you have a feedstock study or a gas study if it's a landfill gas, a landfill. Um, and you know that requires money and that goes back to the to the first page we're talking about having having a, bu a budget to be able to develop these projects properly um so the third factor is understanding the project outputs um what is the quantity and quality if we're talking about power if we're talking about mmbtus um you know and then then what are the environmental attributes that are associated with the uh, the, the the power that's being sold um and and you know how how established are those markets um if you're selling into the rfs or the lcfs markets here in in, in, in the united states are you working with an established pathway uh, for attaining those credits and then a key component in the uh, lcfs market for renewable natural gas, uh, which is, you know, primarily in California right now here in the United States, but there are other mar markets emerging is, you know, what is the carbon intensity score? Um, and a lot of developers um, just make an assumption around that. And that's critical that you understand it on the front end, because it does drive the value received for this particular environmental attribute. And so, um, you know, the best practice is to get a, a, a carbon intensity score study from somebody like an ICF or Eco Engineers, so that you have that in the file, and you and you have you have a, a basis for your assertion about what the expected CI score is once the project's up and running. And then, you know, importantly is is the digestate byproducts and 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 what markets are those being sold into. And what type of contractual terms can be attained in, 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 in pricing, and that is an emerging marketplace, but a very exciting and interesting one, particularly as there's more emphasis on um, uh, on uh, recycled uh, nutrients in the agricultural sector, uh, water quality and discharge in you know, the emerging water credit marketplace. So this 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 is a this is a real added value. Uh, in the long term, to these type of projects, and then fourth factor is purchaser for project outputs. Um, 
you know, you want to make sure you have credit worthy counterparties. Um, and I say that can be diligence because we, we recently ran into a situation where we had a, a foreign buyer of, uh, of output from a U.S. product uh, project. And, um, and it was difficult to track down the uh, principles behind that entity. And, and, uh, and, and one of the uh, uh, underwriters finally passed because they, they couldn't meet their know your customer anti-money laundering rules. Um, uh, you know, then the pricing and the offtake, ideally fixed, but if, if it's floor, what's the, what's the, you know, what's the share on the upside in the environmental attributes or variable pricing, which presents a lot of risk, but if there is uh, good, strong markets, um, that are going to be around for a while and, uh, people can get comfortable with commodity or with the prices of the products in that market, and there's ways to hedge and or structure reserves or sweeps and the cash flow from the project, you can, you can uh, 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 get financing around a variable pricing uh, offtake. And then obviously a long-term agreement or, or term sheet at this early stage that speaks to the years uh, uh, for which the output is contracted. And that helps again with the financing, uh, particularly on the debt side, if you can match amortization to long-term agreements, then you can get more favorable cash flow for the project economics. Um, you know, the next, next page is a continuing list of these components. So ability to access the market for outputs. And so that, you know, that's how do you interconnect to a, uh, uh, an electrical grid if it's, a, if it's a gas to power project or to a natural gas grid if it's an RNG project. And that really is a, that's many times is, is a fatal issue in a lot of these projects is getting the, particularly the RNG projects, getting the gas onto the grid. So you you want to you want to have already established that, um, and with uh, and, and ideally you have approvals. You know what the fees are. And you've even gotten a template for an interconnector or facility agreement with the gas company. You need to know the pipeline specifications, pressure, flow rates, and seasonality of demand. <clears throat> That's a critical one because even though it may appear that the gas company could take the volume of gas coming from the project. Uh, there, there's going to be low points, like uh, particularly during the summer, where the gas demand is low and they may not be able to accept it. And so that, that it, it, it may not be an appropriate injection point for the project. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you can't uh, uh, access through a connection pipeline to a nearby uh, gas system, then you can look at the, vir the virtual transportation and the emerging you know, virtual pipeline uh, marketplace. It's expensive. But uh, for some of these uh, higher priced projects with very, very low CI scores, that is a, 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 an acceptable alternative to uh, compress the RNG and then transport it to an injection point remote from the project. Um, you wanna look at uh, experienced uh, uh, engineering procurement and construction contractor. Um, ideally, they've already gone through the preliminary design and engineering, and you've got a uh, total installed cost basis for financing. And it's not, obviously not going to be a final price, but it's it's good enough to be able to go out to market with confidence, get financing, um, and know what the form of agreement is. And, and if um, you can get to a 60, 70 percent plus design, then you ideally can get a guaranteed maximum price. And then uh, understand what the liquidated damages are for delay or underperformance. Similarly, you want to have an O and M, an operations and maintenance provider selected, again with a form of agreement, and understand what they're willing to do in terms of ongoing performance guarantee for the output from the project. Those are critical. That's critical for the financing. Um, this all wraps up into looking at the economics of the project and how compelling they are uh, in order to get financing. We typically look to see uh, if the projects will have an unlevered return of 12 to 18%, depending on the project type and size. Uh, you know, if you've got well-structured, well-documented, uh, strong credit-worthy parties involved, you know, that's a, that, could, that could be 100% equity financing with a really nice return. You put leverage on it, then the equity returns start to look very, uh, very attractive. Um, so we also want to make sure we can access the debt markets. There's sufficient cash flow from the project to provide the coverage and reserves, the build-up reserves needed. Um, and if and if it's a if it's a power generation project in the U.S., can you access the tax equity markets, which has been challenging lately, just because of the economy, the COVID economy, 
and uh, the shrinking of, of taxable income, therefore the reduction in, in tax equity. And, and the challenge with the anaerobic digester projects in the United States is that uh, you know, it's, there's a lot more risk around uh, uh, bringing tax equity into these type of projects than say solar. Um, and so, so it, it's, it's challenging competitive to get, to get tax equity into anaerobic digester power projects in the United States, but it's doable and there are, there are parties out there that will do that. Finally, you just make sure you have a site for locating your project and you know, either, either a, an option uh, to lease or buy or, or already purchased or, or have a lease in place and make sure the site has the right utility services to provide the power needs for the project. I mean, many times, particularly in these uh, more rural agricultural settings, you may not have the, the uh, local distribution uh, uh, electrical uh, infra infrastructure needed to get the power to a project that's required, particularly if you're running big compressors and things of that nature. And then and then finally, the credit worthiness of the host farm. Um, we, we see a lot of people just skip over this. You know, they think, they think well, we've got a farm, it's got cows, you know, it's manure, we're good. Well, <laughs> look at how long your project's gonna be there. It's, you know, maybe, maybe 10, 15, 20 years. What is the credit worthiness of the farm, particularly in the dairy industry with the challenges it's gone through lately? What is the farmer's wherewithal, uh, you know, outside of the uh, outside of the farm, you know, and their ability to feed losses during downturns in a very commodity-oriented marketplace, and then what are their succession plans? You know, are, are they are are they going to pass it on to their children or to other businessmen, and uh, and, and and so so that you know you've got a long-term project. And then finally, just kind of a sort of kitchen sink here, just. Make sure there's no fatal issues. Um, you know, we, these are all the positive things that you want to look at uh, that we just talked about. But you also want to make sure there's no glaring negative issues, such as any really significant permitting uh, problems or any environmental problems at the site. Uh, unfortunately, not in my backyard is, a, is an increasing one, uh, particularly as urban and rural uh, start to merge with the growth of urban areas and then any third party approvals. So this, this is what we look for. Um, it looks like a lot, but it's what a, a developer needs to do to get a co project to uh, get ready to go to financing. Be happy to talk with anyone about further about it and appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to, to present. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. That was really insightful and lots of uh, items and key components to that. Uh, so it's uh, interesting to see that the financier are even looking at deep dive uh, to these details. So that's that's interesting and refreshing for me. Jonathan, you're next. Please take it from here. Great. Thanks, Amir. And thank you to uh, Anessa and Biogas World for uh, sponsoring the event today. Sure. Let me share my screen. Great. That. There we go. Uh, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jonathan Cristiani. I'm an advanced power fuels engineer with Black and & Beach and going to provide a quick introduction. Uh, Black & Beach is a 10,000 uh, professional employee-owned uh, engineering procurement service firm, uh, construction firm as well, excuse me. Uh, we have about 110 offices across the globe, and at any given point in time, we're managing right around 7,000, 8,000 uh, active projects. Our revenue uh, in 2019 was 3.7 billion, so um, I guess that makes us a mid-size EPC firm. And we have some of the industry's highest safety performance ratings with respect to uh, recordable incident rate and uh, lost time incident rate. Um, Black & Beach offers fully integrated solutions across the, the project uh, lifecycle. Um, we work in a number of different infrastructure uh, industries that I'll, I'll tell you about in a moment here. Um, one of the key aspects of our, uh, you know, 2020 and beyond business strategy has, has revolved around sustainability and the development and, and implementation of sustainable infrastructure. Um, 
quite a few challenges for us to get there, but but we have um, developed a number of different solutions uh, to to help optimize um, you know these sustainable uh, projects across their life cycle. You can kind of see with the graphic here uh, the different piece parts of the project life cycle. Um, I personally work in, in, in consulting primarily, so some of those early stage project development efforts uh, surrounding, you know, uh, concept and, and concept refinement, uh, technology selection, um, you know, sometimes vendor selection uh, in those early stages and, and, and developing uh, kind of a, a site uh, with all its different characteristics. Uh, as we move through the plan solution phase, you know, that's where we're actually starting to do um, more concerted uh, project development, um, preliminary engineering, permitting, uh, looking at different uh, O&M approaches and, and project execution approaches. Um, you know, there's a whole, whole number of different ways you can execute a project. Not everyone uh, needs to be a full wrap EPC. Um, but I'm sure Greg uh, can offer some thoughts on that during the uh, the panel discussion. Um, and then finally, you know, when you get to commercial operation, um, you know, what's 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 the ongoing needs that that need to be done uh, with respect to uh, data analytics and and helping O and M service providers do their job the best that they can. Um, and then finally, over all the all the way over on the right hand side. Um, what can be done with respect to performance management and optimizing uh, these projects over their their full life cycle. So, uh, Black and Beach has expertise across numerous industries. Uh, I personally work within our, our power business, um, but I, I work quite a bit across the different business units that uh, encompass Black and Beach as a whole. Uh, we have uh, a business dedicated to government services. Um, we have a business uh, that supports the mining industry, um, a telecommunications business. We do quite a bit in the oil and gas uh, arena. And then more recently, we've um, started to support uh, uh, the agricultural sector through our next generation agriculture business. Um, and that is typically where we are executing most of our um, biogas and renewable natural gas related projects. Um, and then finally, of course, water. Uh, our water business does quite a bit with respect to uh, biogas in the municipal sector. Um, and as I kind of alluded to on the last chart, you know, our, our services are, are really comprehensive and represent um, the full gamut of, of different uh, services you would hope for from an engineering firm, uh, whether that's uh, consulting on in, in the early stages, uh, providing expertise when it's when it's needed to tough engineering uh, problems, um, ongoing O and M type engineering support, and, and then of course project execution, uh, doing the actual engineering procurement and construction. So um, we're structured to deliver the the full suite and and we serve uh we, we we offer that across all these different markets um a little more specific to biogas and rng um i would say most of our uh, actual epc project work has been done in the municipal wastewater sector uh, via design build uh, type execution um We've also done quite a bit more recently here uh, in terms of AD and biogas upgrading consulting. Um, we serve a lot of different electric and gas utilities who have an interest in, in RNG. And so they want kind of an unbiased view of, of what the different technologies are, how they work, who the companies and, and players are that, that offer those technologies and what would a project cost if, if they were to um, invest in a project or sponsor a project, et cetera. Uh, a large part of our biogas practice is related to supporting um, the lending industry uh, as well as equity investors. So through our management consulting business, um, we, we are a, a provider of technical due diligence type services um, where we're, we're basically acting on the, uh, the, the lender or the investor's behalf to evaluate these projects and make sure it, it checks all the boxes that, that Greg um, so diligently went through 
and and ensure that it's uh, at least coate from the uh, technical uh, perspective. We also support a, a number of gas utilities um, in terms of interconnection, as as I'm sure we'll discuss at least uh, at a high level. Uh, interconnection tends to be one of the biggest challenges that can make or break some of these projects. So uh, having a, a, an engineering firm that knows what they're doing and, and, and can help the utility uh, get the project interconnected is, uh, is going to be um, very important to getting these projects built. And then finally, environmental and permitting. Um, we recently spun off our uh, environmental services uh, group who used to reside within the power business and, and now they're their own business unit within Black and Beach. So we're really excited for them um, to continue to grow and, and to expand uh, their service offerings, um, including in, in the biogas industry. Quick example project um, for you folks today. Uh, as I'm sure some of you know, at least those of you uh, like me who are in North Carolina, um, the city of Raleigh has been in the process of, of upgrading uh, their wastewater treatment facility. And, and as a Raleigh uh, resident, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this project. Um, obviously the feedstock is, is wastewater sludge here. Uh, the end products are, are actually going to be renewable natural gas and class A biosolids. Um, so they're converting uh, uh, the facility from aer aerobic digestion to a thermal hydrolysis with, with AD. Uh, anaerobic digestion, that is. Um, Black and Beach provided uh, early stage uh, technology evaluations, uh, conceptual engineering, and, and helped the city uh, determine what, what the best conversion technologies may be, including for the biogas upgrading piece of it. Um, and we're partnered with uh, Hazen and Sawyer, as well as Crowder uh, Construction, uh, to execute the project. Um, Although we don't have our own low carbon fuel standard in North Carolina, uh, the renewable natural gas will be used as a transportation fuel uh, for city buses and, and municipal um, waste collection vehicles, et cetera. So uh, construction is ongoing right now. And uh, last I checked it, it was scheduled for completion there in uh, early 2022. So we're pretty excited about that. <clears throat> So I wanted to offer maybe a, a, a couple of key themes um, when it comes to identifying profitable projects uh, from the EPC perspective. You know, what, what we've seen um, providing the services I mentioned to you previously, uh, and, and we've been doing this across the country now for, for years, is that every project has some unique aspects um, based on its geography, based on its feedstock, um, some of the technologies that, that are being selected, some of the vendors and partners that are involved. So you need to, to bear in mind what those unique, unique aspects are and understand what challenges that, that may come uh, from them. Um, optimization of carbon intensity, I think is, is, is a big theme that, that we'll talk about today. Um, that comes down to technology selection, feedstock management, collection, et cetera. Um, and then evaluating, you know, potential revenues from co-products is is a new and emerging um, type of, of of theme that uh, I think is, is going to only grow as the industry continues to grow. Um, your ability to get permitted in a timely manner, and 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 you know, keep the project uh, on schedule and uh, financeable is is going to take a concerted, um, you know bit of design work up front. And so I really appreciate, Greg, you, you plug in um, some of these early stage uh, development activities. Uh, a lot of developers maybe don't always want to spend that money up front, but that's what's going to get your project uh, uh, built and, and financed. So got to do it. Um, and then obviously, I, I talked about the challenges of interconnection. Um, definitely engage with the gas utility early to understand what those costs are going to be and whether it's a, a potential red flag or fatal flaw um, for the project. So uh, project execution that adheres to these best practices uh, will ultimately result in, in lower costs and, and higher profits over the life cycle. And we've seen that uh, from both sides. <laughs> so thank you very much and looking forward to the panel discussion here.
Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was interesting to see a consulting point of view of these projects development. Uh, we'll jump into the questions. Uh, we have some other questions coming on the, from the panelists, uh, from the attendees. Uh, I just remind again, if you have any question, please uh, use the QA button at the uh, bottom of your screen so you can share your question with us so we can have uh, our panelists to contribute to those questions. That's uh, great. I'm, I'm gonna jump into uh, one interesting question. It looks like that uh, we have seen in this all three presentation talking about some um, avoiding mistakes. So what mistakes you all of you guys, I will start with Christian as a technology vendor, uh, you see on the early stage of the project project developments, most of these either project developers or originators, as uh, Greg mentioned about that, uh, are, uh, are doing. And those mistakes making the projects either not develop further or even if after develop failing. So can we talk about that, Christian? And you are mute, so if you unmute yourself. Um, yeah, one of the major mistakes is uh, that you had not the right estimation for the building site has already been mentioned uh, you have a lot of issues what we have here in europe and i think it's the same in the states for permitting as uh, greg said not in my backyard uh, people try to avoid where everywhere it's a trend uh, renewable energies they don't like photovoltaics they don't like wind turbines they don't like biogas plants so you have to go in the early stage to the permitting department and ask if it's possible mm. with the first concept to build a biogas plant there because then it directly can break down the complete project because if you have to move 50 kilometers or miles or on a different area uh, transport costs are becoming so heavily and have such an impact on projects that then they're not any more feasible for example mm -hmm. Greg, well, what do you see as a common mistake? Uh, well, um, a lack of capital, insufficient funds to get to NTP. You know, they, they, they have conceived of a nice project, but can't, don't have the wherewithal to pull all the pieces together to get to the NTP. So that, 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 that's unfortunately a common issue. Um, so sort of more uh, nuanced, um, underestimating the CI score. Um, you know, that, that is critical, um, particularly for the LCFS market and, and, and understanding the long-term position of the gas in that marketplace, given the increasing amount of lower score, uh, score gas coming on the market. So you really do need to understand that. And you need to know how the CI, how the LCFS market works when you price those credits into your model and the dilution uh, over time. So, so that, that's another one. Uh, those, are, those are two that we see. Uh, see in, in a lot of models that we get from from uh, developers. Okay, that's that's great. We will back to one of those the points lack of the capital, but I'd like to hear Jonathan's point about this question: common mistakes in a early stage of the project developments. Yeah, I'll, I'll re-emphasize what I said there towards the end of my my slide deck. Um, interconnection is, is one that if you're not thinking about it early and what your approach needs to be and engaging with the utility and understanding how high those costs can be and what the ongoing costs are going to be. Um, I've seen a couple of projects uh, end up in, in, in the waste bin as a result of, of not having done that early and often. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's interesting to see. Uh, one thing that we are seeing a lot in the industry, especially in the North American context that Sometimes uh, uh, technology vendors, they are coming and providing that funding or the capital required for the early stage of these projects development. So back to your point about Greg, lack of funding. How do you see that can change the project development? So because they are bringing the money in with the idea that at some point their technology be used in those projects. How that's gonna affect, is it gonna be a BIOS evaluation or are we gonna see no movement on the project development. I think, I think that's beneficial to the industry overall um, because it does allow, it, it provides the capital needed to get these projects uh, moving forward. I mean, obviously the developers need to be careful 
and making certain that they are selecting the right technology that doesn't compromise the, mm -hmm. the overall integrity or process of the project. And that's where somebody like Jonathan's firm can help on the front end to make certain that if you are going, because you're committed to that technology now, mm -hmm. if you take money from that vendor, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, you just don't want that to compromise the ultimate uh, the optimization of the project down the road. Okay. Uh, Christian, on your view, you are a technology vendor to the ta in the table. So do you guys do you support the financing of any project developments? If so, how, how that uh, pan out for your project developments? Well, uh, we are not doing it directly. We try to bring special banks in or uh, trustworthy companies which do such things like Euler Hermes, for example, which might be known as an international a system for for uh, financing such projects so that's how we can help mm -hmm. to uh, make such projects uh, feasible and that they get some financing okay that's but if, I, if i may ask a question christian okay. are you using your balance sheet to facilitate that financing or is it truly a, a standalone a standalone financing supported by the project because early i mean early on there's not much there from a credit standpoint to yeah something like that of course, yeah, we, we can, of, of course, we can stay for a project with, with our reputation, our balance sheet, yes. But at the end, this is a question, uh, as we are not directly taking each, each project, someone has to develop it, someone has to bring it on the table, of course, and we are stepping into it and helping to, to get the right. finance and bring it over the line, of course, yes. Yeah, I would expect, I would expect any vendor type financing like that would get taken out at the permit at the at the construction permit financing when it closes so it's really just it's bridge financing to yeah. get to permanent financing which is great i mean that, right. that really does help bring liquidity much needed liquidity into this uh, development marketplace mm -hmm. that's yeah that's right uh there are uh some interesting questions coming from the attendees that's kind of related to uh, this uh, last point you made, Greg, about the CI score. Uh, so how that, I'm, I'm rephrasing the question a little bit up that evaluating the optimizing CI score, does it work in terms of you, Jonathan talked about the technology and the feedstock uh, effect of those items in the CI scores. How, uh, how those technology selection affecting CI scores and how it's possible to optimize the CI score to make sure that it's going to be uh, related to reality of these projects after it's the projects up and running. Greg, I thought that one was for you. Oh, was I'm sorry. Was it for me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was re I was reading one of the questions in the comments. That this was a really good question in the comment. I'm sorry, Amir. I apologize. Totally. No, no, no. Uh, the question is about the CI score. How to optimize the CI score? So Jonathan was talking about that the the CI score can be affected by the technologies and the yep. stock selection process. So you refer to that uh, to make sure that on one of the common mistakes that the CI score optimizing the CI score. So how oh, yeah. the selecting the technology can affect uh, uh, the CI score? Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely at the edge of my technological knowledge here on that point. And that's why you have the folks like ICF and eco engineers that can come in and help to optimize. But, but um, you know, there, uh, there is a uh, balance to be struck on, the, on the, uh, the, the gas output from the system. Mm -hmm and it's a dilutive effect on the CI score, uh, given the energy, the energy content that goes, goes into a, you know, a set amount of emissions to be reduced at the site. So the greater the amount of, uh, of, of energy being generated uh, divided into that set emissions amount, then the lower your, 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 uh, the lower the, the energy, the, the lower the CI score, or the higher the CI score you're gonna get. Right. It's not going to be as low. And so that's one, that's one thing to look at is your technology that you're selecting in the output, given the energy content of the manure or whatever your feedstock is that's coming in. Mm -hmm. And how dilutive is that going to be on your CI score? And, and I, I've been speaking in, in real time about that because you know, uh, that, that uh, company I mentioned, Sustain RNG, mm -hmm. it's got a really interesting uh, anaerobic digester technology license from train technologies that optimizes the biomethane production. So you get a lot of, a lot of energy out of a manure 
But as a result of that, your CI score is diluted and it's not nearly as, as attractive long-term um, as maybe a swine you know, or, or a, a dairy that's using a conventional digester technology with a, with a lower energy output. So right. you, 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 gotta, you gotta balance that and find alternative, be, right. you know, be nimble in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, do you have any comment on that? No, I think Greg was, was spot on there. Um, it, it really takes kind of a, a, a concerted study to learn how best you can, you can optimize that, that CI score. Um, and, and like I said, some of that is going to uh, bear out as part of the digestion technology selection and biogas upgrading technology selection. Where, where can I, you know, uh, use my my thermal management engineering skills to make the efficient uh, the process as efficient as it can be. Um, you know, am I using fossil based natural gas to provide heating versus biogas? That biogas is pretty uh, pretty profitable, so we mm -hmm. want as much of that going into R and G as we can. And if we're burning it on site for heat, that that may not be the most optimum uh, uh, use of it uh, in terms of profitability. So. Uh, I think it really uh, takes uh, a, li a life cycle analysis perspective on it, and and doing that upfront and early as you're as you're working your way through conceptual engineering, awesome. uh, in, in order to get it done. That's great. Yeah, that's great. So we have four more minutes to go, and I'm gonna di deep uh, uh, dive into the QA panel here. I think uh, Jonathan, this is for you. Uh, uh, the question is around the digestate. So. In an early stage of the project development, uh, if there is no, if most of the possible buyers or receivers are not eager to compromise to give a price unit for the biogas plant, uh, how they can, which is not operating and built, how you are evaluating those uh, kind of projects and including the digestate uh, cost and benefit in the, in the project evaluation. Sure. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because, you know, I mentioned the potential revenues from from co-products such as recovered nutrients. Um, but at, at the end of the day, I don't know that the lender and equity investor community is, is really too hot on on those potential revenues. Uh, the ones we've worked with view it basically as as pure upside um, if you can get it done. And so, you know, maybe that that has caused some of the developers to be less um, uh, gung ho when it comes to, you know, mm -hmm. getting off take contracts in place for it. Um, but there are, you know, some projects that we're seeing getting put together where where the nutrients, the recover nutrients are a strong emphasis right. um, from the get go. And they're planning on uh, the requisite process equipment in order to. Uh, separate, segregating, and get to higher value um, mm -hmm. types of co-products. And, and you, you, you will see that on the actual pro formas that uh, when, when they're applying for their, their funding. So oh, that's great. So, so on that point, Amir, um, you know, one, of the pro one of the programs that we administer is the North Carolina Agricultural Finance Authority's Green Community Program. And, and we are working on the financing of a poultry digester project. Mm -hmm. That program right now, we're there are two digestate streams, an ammonia fertilizer and ammonia water. Mm -hmm. I have been contracted oh. uh, to, to be purchased. And so based on that, we're able, we're, 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 we're able to get interest in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, tax and bond markets right. with the financing of that project. Yeah, that's, that's great. So for the folks that they have some projects that they're interested on that, please reach out to Greg on that. So Greg, I think this question will go to you uh, in terms of the, uh, government subsidies. So there are biogas, it looks like the biogas projects is not going to work without government subsidies. Uh, does biogas plan from the food waste is profitable? And if yes, what's the percentage of the return on investment as investors that you are looking to have in those type of projects? On food waste projects? Correct. I, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be straight up with you. I have, we have done swine, we've done dairy, we've done landfill gas, we've done poultry. I have not done a food waste project, so I cannot speak to economics on food waste. I'm sorry. I'd like to look at a food waste project. Uh -huh. I, I still think that, you know, that, that parameter that I spoke of 12 to 18% on lever would be a benchmark. Um, but I would love to look at a food waste project and understand it better to be able to speak to the economics. So I'm just right. making it up. I mean, right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, Amir, I, I, Black and Veatch has taken a look um, at some of the economic drivers there, and I would say um, above and beyond the the main source of revenues is going to be your tipping fees for for taking yeah. uh, right. that that food waste in. So it's a little less um, sensitive when it comes to uh, the the biogas itself and and the associated carbon intensity. Um, but yeah, if you if you didn't have those tipping fees, I don't think any of those projects would 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 get off the page they're written on. Well, now I don't, I don't let's not throw cold water on that marketplace <laughs> um, because I think I think with the advent of voluntary uh, buyers coming into the market that are looking for RNG, regardless of of you know whether it's Scott Renz or LCFS, they just they want sustainable supply. Right. You, you you might be able to get to a price point on those contracts where those projects become economical. And then also post-industrial food waste where it's being consumed by the host facility and site, that could have economic. So I think there's interesting opportunities. I just, I, I don't have one that I can point to that I've right. worked on. Yeah, we, we are working with a number of uh, vendors and uh, project developers that they are looking at the co-digestion opportunities to be able to have that source of the feed stuff yep. that you're talking. So that's that's interesting that we can see uh, in North America that uh, some of these projects, how it's going to uh, develop. So it's fairly, uh, the hot topic is manure-based projects right, these days, but I, I see that in the, in the near future, co-digestion with the food waste is is the is the the trend for the for the market we so, have a few in europe sure. these projects already yeah. so um, but they are all based on a feed-in tariff system so they are right. going also into the biomethane and the carbon reductions or and also as i said before there are the the supermarket groceries uh, and, the, and the big suppliers which are also sometimes behind the scenes working on these projects Right, right. That's that's great that we have we have seen in your presentation a number of those uh, vendors that they have access to a different sort of feed yeah. stuff they can uh, play a role. So that will bring us to the end of the webinar. It's uh, we have a number of other questions that we didn't get a chance to answer it, but uh, I'll encourage all the participants to uh, reach out to our uh, attend uh, to the panelists uh, after receiving the recordings and the contact information uh, tomorrow. So if you have any question directly, please reach out. Any last comment, Christian, from you? We'll start from you. Well, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure to, to learn from you all uh, a, lot, a little bit more about the North American biogas market. And I hope uh, we can step more into your market. Maybe I'll also work with you guys together. And if someone who's listening in the panel is uh, looking for a biogas plant supplier, please get in touch with us. That's great. Thank you so much, Greg. I just say it, it, it's a pleasure to speak. It's an exciting emerging industry. There's a lot of policy that's uh, on the, that's coming forth that will support the growth of this industry. So it, it, it's exciting times ahead of us. That's great. Jonathan? Uh, well, thank you again to Anessa and Biogas World for sponsoring the event. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to be able to participate. And um, and yeah, just, just keep in mind, uh, some of those main themes that I emphasized, um, especially getting uh, some of the major engineering tasks out of the way early. That way you can uh, ensure your project will be successful. That's yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you all for the Thanks, folks. Uh, participants and attendees. Uh, we will have another, our next webinar on the February the 18th that we are gonna look into some innovations in the industries. So stay safe and we'll see you then. Have a good day. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh,